I'm Matt Howard. I'm the head of communications here at the laboratory, and I'm really excited to have you here tonight for the next installment of our Argonne Out Loud series. We do these because we really want to engage the public on some of our cutting edge research, uh, especially on topics that really resonate with, with all of us. And tonight, it's on batteries and energy storage. Um, but first, let me just tell you about two of our uh, upcoming lectures. Um, both will be held in the city of Chicago. Um, you will be able to watch them online if you can't make it into the city, but I wanted to let you know about them anyway. The first is with Argonne senior scientist and part-time film and television actor, Marius Stan. Uh, he was on the TV show Breaking Bad, for those who have uh, watched that show. And he's giving a talk on the science of cinema and this will be held on Saturday, November 23rd, and it's from 12 to 1.30 at the Chicago Cultural Center. The second event, also held in the city, um, in conjunction with the Chicago Council on Science and Technology, is called The Nature of Nano, uh, and that'll be held on the evening of December 11th at the Northwestern University Chicago campus, and this is on Superior Street downtown. So mark your calendars. Uh, you can also check our website. We'll be having these updated on our homepage so you can, when you're um, interested in joining a public lecture, um, you'll see it advertised there. The focus of tonight's talk is energy storage, batteries. One of the re top research priorities for the laboratory uh, and really for the nation. Uh, this goes far beyond cell phones and flashlights and things like that. Uh, better batteries will have a revolutionary impact on the automobile industry, namely. Um, and energy storage is one of the issues holding back the expansion of renewable power, uh, power sources like wind and solar. How do we store energy from renewable sources on the grid, for example? And recognizing the enormous potential of next generation batteries, the Department of Energy, uh, about a year ago, funded the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research, what we call J. Caesar. Uh, it's a consortium of 14 institutions, including national laboratories, universities, and, uh, and private companies. The ambitious plan, which George will talk about tonight, uh, is to go beyond today's best lithium ion battery systems to provide five times the energy storage at one fifth the cost within five years. So it's a pretty ambitious goal we have. Uh, our speaker tonight, Dr. George Crabtree, is Jay Caesar's director. His talk will cover the program, uh, the program's aggressive goal, its vision and its strategy, and its place in Argonne's broad landscape of energy storage research. Dr. Crabtree is a senior scientist and an Argonne Distinguished Fellow uh, in Argonne's Material Science Division. He's won many awards uh, for his research most recently, the Kamerling Onish Prize in 2003 for his work on the physics of vortices in high temperature superconductors. Uh, Dr. Crabtree's research interests include material science, sustainable energy, nanoscale uh, uh, superconductors and magnets, uh, vortex matter and superconductors, and highly correlated electrons and metal. Please join me in uh, welcoming Dr. George Crabtree. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> so thank you, Matt. That was a wonderful introduction. And I have to second what uh, Matt said when he first got up to speak. It's wonderful to see so many people coming out for an event on science, on technology, and energy especially, which touches all of our lives. Uh, and I hope that I can tell you something. Some of you may have heard some of this before. Others, it may be the first time about the battery research program and the importance of energy storage, namely electricity storage, for the future of the grid and transportation. And as Matt indicated, these are two of our major topics. So it's, a, it's my pleasure to represent Jay Caesar, and uh, please, I'd like to have an interactive discussion, so it might be hard to ask questions uh, during the talk, but afterwards, I would love to, ha to hear all the questions, and, and I'll certainly try to answer. So the things I would like to tell you about are here in my outline. First, transportation and the electricity grid. Uh, that's a big fraction of the energy we use in this country. Uh, then Jay Caesar, as Matt already indicated, has some aggressive goals 
They're visionary and uh, they're aspirational. So I'll tell you about our vision, our mission, and our legacies, namely how we're going to achieve these goals. Describe in a little bit of detail the new paradigm because you may, uh, some of you may know this, that in the battery community, it's typical to do things by trial and error. And you say, I want to have a better cathode for my battery. Let me try this one. If it works, I'll use it. If it doesn't work, I'll throw it away and try something else. But I'll never ask the question, why did it fail or why did it work? And that is a basic feature of Jay Caesar. We feel that if we can understand why things happen, that is fail or work, we can make batteries very much better than those we have today. So that's part of the new paradigm. We have three storage concept, uh, concepts. A thing we call the strategic roadmap, which will indicate to you, I hope, uh, the complexity of the battery challenge and also the many, many opportunities for solving it. And then a couple of highlights. So that's uh, the plan. So let's start with the energy storage opportunity. So here in this ring is all the energy that we used in 2009 and it's divided by its use. And you see the very biggest one is the yellow one, transportation. 29% of the energy used in this country went to drive cars and trucks and fly airplanes. Uh, and I should say mostly drive cars and trucks. Airplanes use a tiny fraction of that 29%. Uh, the, ne the next biggest, or even bigger if you add them up, are these three gray sections which represent the electricity grid. So residential, commercial, and industrial, together they add up to 40%. So 40 plus 29, nearly 70% of our energy goes to these two sectors. And the interesting thing about these two sectors is that they're both poised and waiting for a transformation. So in the case of transportation, it's obvious what the transformation is. It's replacing foreign oil with domestic electricity and in the process, reducing carbon emissions. Because an electric car, of course, it depends on where you get the electricity from, but if you get it from anywhere but coal, you'll produce fewer CO, uh, less, fewer CO2 emissions per mile driven with electricity than you do with uh, a conventional gas car. So there are lots of advantages there uh, uh, to electrify transportation. In the electricity grid, there's really two transitions going on. The first one from coal to gas is already happening well underway because we, of the abundance and, uh, uh, and cheapness of shale gas. So that's now the choice. And the Environmental Protection Agency helps that by putting uh, requirements for uh, emissions of power plants that coal plants really find it very hard to meet, very expensive to meet. So the first part of this transition is already happening. The second part, and the bigger part, is to go from gas to wind and solar. So wind and solar now makes up about 4% of our electricity. The goal is to have it be 20% or 30%. And technically, there's enough wind and solar. It could be even much bigger than that. Some people are saying 50%. Not, not, uh, outside our grasp. Uh, but the thing about wind and solar is that they're variable generation. So you can't predict when the, when the wind is going to blow and when the clouds are going to obscure the sun. Uh, and that means, for example, in every wind farm, no matter how big, there's usually one day per month when the wind doesn't blow at all. And if wind is supplying you only 4% of your electricity, well, you can just make that up from someplace else. Else, If it's 20%, you have to back it up with something. The thing that people back it up with now, or at least the plan, is to build a gas plant right next to the wind farm, which has the same capacity. And you turn it on on those days when the wind doesn't blow. A very bad use of resources, because you're building twice the infrastructure that you need for most days, and you use it, own, use the gas plant only a few days per year. So a better solution is storage, right? So if you could have storage for the grid, uh, you would reduce carbon emissions because you'd be taking gas out of the system and replacing it with wind and solar, and you'd have a sustainable energy supply. 
So the interesting thing is that both of these transformations are waiting for one thing, the same thing, uh, inexpensive, high-performance electrical energy storage. So the next, this graph shows what Jay Caesar wants to do, its vision, its mission, its legacies. So on the left-hand side, you see the numbers. We've codified all this, and I'm happy to explain those to the technical folks that are interested. But it's easier, easier to understand the concepts. So the vision is, as we were saying, transform transportation and the electricity grid with high-performance, low-cost energy storage. How will we do that? Our mission has this slogan or dictum that we've developed, 555. It means five times the energy density, batteries with five times the energy density, and one-fifth the cost of today's commercial batteries within five years. Very aggressive goal. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but we'll, how will we do that? We'll do, we'll do that with what we call our legacies, the things we will leave behind and, in a sense, teach the world about. The first one is a library of fundamental science about the phenomena and materials of energy storage at the atomic and molecular level. And as we were saying earlier, the typical battery R&D operation doesn't operate off fundamental knowledge. They operate off trial and error. Let me try it. If it works, I'll use it. If it doesn't work, I'll throw it away and try something else. So a new feature, which we are introducing into that, uh, into that traditional paradigm, is to understand why it worked or why it failed and do that at the atomic and molecular level. You can do that now. It's very timely because we've had about 15 years of nanoscience. It was in about the year 2000 that the word nano, in the sense of nanotechnology and nanoscience, came into common usage. And in the last 15 years or so, we've developed an enormous number of tools to look at the atomic and molecular level to see what's going on, and another set of tools to control what happens at the atomic and molecular level. So one of the pillars of J. Caesar is to use these new nano tools to build the next generation battery. So that's the first legacy. Second legacy is, explains our 555 dictum. So we want to build two prototypes, one for the grid, one for the car. There'll be different kinds of batteries, because in a car you want a small, lightweight, portable battery. For the grid, it doesn't have to be small, it doesn't have to be lightweight, and it doesn't have to be portable. So they'll look different, but they will be based basically on the same technology, or they could be based on the same technology. So to finish this sentence, uh, two prototypes, one for the car, one for the grid, that when scaled up to manufacturing, are capable of delivering on our 555 goals. Now, it's important to understand that we're going to make a prototype, and in fact, a research prototype that you would make in the lab and might be about this big, not a commercial prototype that a manufacturer could take to market. And these are two very different things. So we will build a prototype that's a proof of principle that demonstrates you could do this, uh, but not the one that will be manufactured. So that's another challenge. We'll come back to that in a minute. The third legacy is very important. And in fact, I don't think we would achieve 555 without this third legacy. It's a new paradigm for battery R&D that integrates discovery science, battery design, research prototyping, and manufacturing collaboration all in one highly interactive, and the, word highly, the words highly interactive are very important, one highly interactive organization that talks to itself across these boundaries. So uh, you might say our goal is to make the next generation battery. That's true. But we treat these three legacies, as we call them, our sub-goals, as equally important. You can't build that next generation battery without uh, implementing all three of these legacies. That's our thesis. OK, why 555? Every time we say 555, everyone says, that's pretty ambitious. True, it is. 
Uh, and here's an answer to that. I'll give you a couple of answers. The first answer is that if you do something less than 555, it won't be transformative. And our goal is to transform, not just to slightly improve, but to change the way we deal with transportation and the electricity grid. So you need that for, we talked about backing up solar and wind farms when they eventually supply 20 or 30% of our electricity. Uh, you have to make storage five times cheaper to compete with a gas turbine. A gas turbine is just very inexpensive. So there's the, one of the factors of five. And in transportation, a uh, gasoline car goes maybe 300, or my car, which is a four-cylinder Honda, goes 400 miles on a tank. The typical mass market electric car, so the Volt and the Leaf, they go maybe 38 or 63 miles, depending on which car you're talking about. So there's about a factor of five there in range that you need to make up. So these factors of five are not chosen arbitrarily. They're chosen to have a transformational effect. So that's the first point. Second point is that these factors of five are well within what science will allow. So the famous statement, scientists always like to do this, take the back of an envelope and a pencil, so not even a computer, uh, and ask yourself, if, if I did everything right, what's the best battery performance I could achieve? So I don't violate any laws of physics or chemistry, but I get the benefit of going very close to the limit. And the answer the whole community agrees is a factor of 10. So we're asking for a factor of five, half the theoretical potential. So it's well within the reach of what science will allow us to do. And secondly, it's also within reach of what technology can deliver. So most energy technologies, when they're mature, and lithium ion batteries are a good example of this, they deliver about half the theoretical potential. And that, as it happens, is exactly what we're shooting for. So we're not shooting for anything that's uh, outside our reach or our grasp. Uh, it would be very similar to all the other energy technologies once it's developed and mature. So, but that does bring up another question, how are you gonna do this? Lithium ion batteries are the best battery technology that we've ever seen. That's why they're in our cell phones and lots of other places as well. They operate very well. They, in fact, uh, get better at 5% per year in energy density. If you look at the last decade, that's the trend, that's the average. And their cost goes down by about 8% per year, again, over the last decade. An amazing record. I, I said that's the best battery technology we've seen. But if you're looking for a factor of five, you won't get it from lithium ion. These are just too small, these increases. So Jay Caesar made a strategic decision to look only beyond lithium ion. So we, you won't get the factor of five from lithium ion, you have to look beyond it. And one of the features about this beyond lithium ion space is that it's largely unexplored. So we know a lot about lithium ion batteries. They've been commercial since the early 90s. So we've got lots of experience with them. We know almost nothing about the space beyond lithium ion. And that's one reason why Jay Caesar strategically decided to pursue it. There's lots of opportunity there, and we'll see a little bit later, that there are many, many ways to create a beyond lithium ion battery that could, in principle, be five times better. So these are some of the background for why Jay Caesar chose to do what it chose to do. Here is our new paradigm. So here's a visual sort of diagram, functional diagram, of our new paradigm. And you remember I said, what do we do? We combine discovery science, that's right here, battery design, research prototyping, and manufacturing collaboration, all in one highly interactive organization. So I should tell you right now, there's an imaginary dotted line between this manufacturing and the research prototyping. We're not gonna manufacture, don't have enough money to do that, we don't know how to do it. Manufacturers have to do that. But we talk with the manufacturers intensely. So that's what it means, manufacturing collaboration, so that 
well, when we finally make our prototypes, we'll be able to transfer them to the commercial sector easily and quickly. So that's the reason for that fourth component. Uh, we bring to the table a lot of special features in every one of these uh, sections. In the, in the discovery science section, we bring a thing called materials and electrolyte genomes. And the idea here is that you need a better anode or a better cathode for your battery. You survey 1,000 or maybe 10,000 candidate materials that could make up that anode or cathode on a computer. You model them. You simulate them. You don't do anything in the lab. Uh, and you look at all of those 1,000 or 10,000 candidates, and you may find five or some small number that are the most promising, you make those five in the laboratory. And that dramatically cuts down the time required to survey that huge database of 1,000 or 10,000 materials. So that makes it faster. You can do it a lot faster on the computer than you can in the laboratory. So the materials genome has been around for a long time, well, five years or so. Uh, Jay Caesar didn't invent that, but we did invent the electrolyte genome, which is the liquid between the anode and cathode uh, that is critical to every battery technology. And only two or three, there are a few, a handful, that are used today. But there are lots more out there that are not explored. Let's explore them on the computer by simulation. Every one of our reviewers, we had eight reviewers for our proposal, they highlighted this electrolyte genome and said, that's a good idea. You really ought to do it. So I think we got a resonance there. When it comes to making the materials, we have a thing called the Electrochemical Discovery Lab, EDL. It's uh, many rooms full of equipment. The equipment looks something like this. Uh, this has now been designed. So what do you do with this equipment? You synthesize the materials for the next generation battery, and you move it along to various characterization stations to make measurements without ever taking it out of its protected environment, whether it's a high vacuum or argon atmosphere or some other atmosphere. And the advantage of that is that you treat every candidate material the same systematically. So you can compare your measurements one to the other and immediately have a reliable comparison to choose the best ones. So, uh, this is now uh, fully designed. The orders are just about out. Some of the electrochemical discovery labor laboratories already in operation, and uh, it will be a major step forward, a state-of-the-art, new state-of-the-art uh, advance for batteries. When it comes to designing batteries and analyzing the batteries, we do a similar thing to what we did with materials. So we call it building the battery on a computer. And it goes by the, this technical name, techno-economic modeling. So you take all the materials in a battery design. For example, imagine that 20 different battery designs come from the left, from the discovery science part of J. Caesar. All 20 will be modeled on the computer for two things. We'll be looking at how do they perform and what's the manufacturing cost. So these are our first two fives. Uh, and, uh, will ask if it's good enough to promote to research proto prototyping or not. So 20 come forward, 20 are modeled, four maybe get promoted. The other 16 that are not good enough are still valuable. It's a good experience because we'll find out why they failed. So in every battery system or system of any kind, there's usually one component that doesn't perform up to the, the level of the others. We'll find out which one that is. Uh, and we can send that information, here's the reason it failed, back to our discovery science teams and say, here's a challenge for you, fix this, and then this battery system will operate better. So that's an example of communicating backwards along this, uh, uh, along this uh, production chain or discovery chain, design chain, uh, in, in addition to communicating forwards. So we'll take uh, these uh, four batteries that perhaps we'll make prototypes out of. And we have an innovation here, too. Here's another ring. It has four colors on that ring. And those four colors represent each of the four sections 
functional sections of J. Caesar. So discovery science, battery design, of course, prototyping, and commercial manufacturing. And we'll have representatives from each of those sections overseeing the prototyping so that if an issue is spotted and the issue is a basic science issue, the representative on that team will immediately recognize it and direct it back to the basic science teams to be worked on. If it's a design problem, the design rep will spot it and bring it back to the design teams. If it's an issue that you can't really manufacture this battery, there's some, something that you can do in the lab but doesn't scale up to manufacturing well, our manufacturing rep will recognize it and say, we've got to fix this. So this translational development team, that's what TDT stands for, uh, will dramatically accelerate the progress when you get to the prototyping phase. And this is, doesn't happen in the larger battery community. That is, all of these functions are very often filled by separate organizations or by parts of an organization that don't talk to each other. So these are the things we bring to the table, the distinguishing features of J. Caesar that define our new paradigm. Uh, there's another interesting, more conceptual feature. We have to produce batteries that are five times better and five times cheaper. That's our goal. We will define challenges at the top that must be met if the batteries we design are going to fulfill these goals. So we have top-down challenges, challenges defined by the outcomes, and bottom-up research, again, from the atomic and molecular level, that address those challenges. So we're very directed. We don't want the, res the basic research to be uh, restrained in any way, so it's free and open, bottom-up, but it's research to, to certain challenges that are defined by the batteries we want to build. So one of the things we'll get out of this is a new building. And that's because the state of Illinois, at the time we turned our proposal in, promised to build a thing called the Energy Innovation Center, the name of the building, which would be strictly for J. Caesar. We've now, we're in the design phase. It's a triangular building, as you see there, two floors, uh, designed for open collaboration. So we want everyone in J. Caesar to talk to everyone else. That's our design principle for our new paradigm. So there's a lot of open space. And we found a site on the Argonne campus for it. If you recognize the Argonne campus, this is the new building. That's the administration building. That's the cafeteria. The gate where you come in is sort of up that way. Uh, and it will be right here on a vacant lot, so to speak, on the Argonne campus, conveniently located for some of the other uh, scientists and buildings that it has to interact with. So we expect this will be done in 2015. Um, so I, Matt mentioned partners. I haven't mentioned them yet. Let me do that now. So here's our new paradigm. And we have 14 partners led by Argonne, so Argonne plus 13 others. Why so many? Because we wanted to get the best scientists, a so-called dream team, and engineers that we could for J. Caesar, and they're never all at one place. So you have to cherry pick from the various institutions. So here are 14. We have five national labs. You'll recognize Argonne, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, Sandia Lab, SLAC, that's at Stanford, and Pacific Northwest Lab all have significant uh, battery expertise and histories and programs that we're drawing from. We have five universities from here up, all mostly around Chicago. Uh, you recognize all of these, UIC, Urbana, which is not far away, Northwestern, University of Chicago, and here's the University of Michigan for their connection to the automotive industry. We also have faculty from other universities who are not formally partners, uh, but from MIT, University of Waterloo in Canada, Harvard, and Notre Dame who also contribute to J. Caesar. So this is really a wonderful research team. In addition, we have four private sector companies, and they're chosen strategically. So Johnson Controls, it's up in Milwaukee, the biggest battery manufacturer of lead acid batteries. They understand very well that that's not going to be the future, although it's a wonderful market now. Uh, and they'd like to get in on the future. So that's one reason they're interested in us. We're interested in them because they understand the manufacturing business. 
So we can go to them for consultation. Could you make this prototype? Uh, so the second company is Dow Chemical. They're a materials company. And in particular, they're a high throughput materials company. That's uh, a, a, a feature we would like to have in J. Caesar. So we'll be learning from them for things like the Electrochemical Discovery Lab, how to do this from the experts. Applied Materials is on the West Coast in Silicon Valley. They are the major, by far major, uh, manufacturer of, uh, of, of manufacturing equipment for the semiconductor industry. So they make the tools and the machines that make our chips and computers and so on. The reason they're interesting is that the semiconductor business is full of thin films that are stacked one on top of the other. That's true of the battery business, too. So from sort of a morphological point of view, it's the same problem. They'd like to break into the battery business if there's an opportunity. We'd like to learn from them how to build the manufacturing equipment uh, for the next generation battery. And finally, Clean Energy Trust. It's a nonprofit in Chicago, but they have very strong connections on both coasts. Their business is entrepreneurship. And we feel that in J. Caesar and the Next Generation Battery, there's lots of opportunities for startup companies, for innovation. You need more than just the battery. You need a control system. Eventually, if it's on cars, you'll need charging stations. You know, there's just plenty of opportunities for small, risk-taking startup companies to start the ball rolling and let them be bought by the big guys. When it proves to be successful, that's fine. That's a good way to start the machine going. So I want to show you now how a lithium ion battery works. So imagine you're inside a lithium ion battery. This is the anode, usually graphite, a thing called an interface layer. It's called the solid electrolyte interface, a liquid electrolyte, then another SEI over here next to the cathode, which is typically either uh, cobalt oxide or uh, iron phosphate. And the battery goes back and forth, just as you should see it doing here. It's now on the charge side. So you've applied a voltage to the battery to recharge it. And you see that as each lithium ion comes across, uh, there's an equivalent electron going in the external circuit. So every electron that goes through your car uh, is accompanied by a lithium atom in, uh, ion in the battery, which moves in the same direction. So, this is, so what happens is you cycle the battery, the lithium ions, back and forth, storing energy and releasing on every cycle. That's how a lithium ion battery works. Now, there are some things we can do better. I mentioned in my outline that there are three concepts, energy storage concepts, that J. Caesar is going to pursue. And here they are. They're actually remarkably easy to understand. So a lithium ion has one charge on it. And that's how it, store, it stores and releases energy proportional to that one charge. Why don't you replace that with a magnesium ion that has two charges, or an aluminum ion that has three charges, and immediately double or triple the energy density of the battery just by replacing the lithium? So uh, this is an idea that's been around, not original with J. Caesar. But there are lots of scientific reasons that prevent just simply making that replacement. And what Jay Caesar will do is investigate those scientific barriers and overcome them so that indeed you can replace uh, the, uh, the singly charged lithium with a doubly or a triply charged ion. That's the first idea. Second idea, you'll see here, and you could have seen in the last animation, that the lithium ions are stored between the layers of some layered material. So it's graphite in the case of the lithium ion battery on the anode. The, the lithium goes in, it's stored there, it comes out. The graphite stays there, taking up space and weighing something uh, during that entire process. Why not get rid of that intercalation process and replace it with a chemical reaction? So let the lithium react with something that it likes to react with, for example, oxygen, of which there's plenty, of course, in the air, uh, and get rid of the intercalation host altogether. So you'll get a much higher energy density. And in fact, 
It's the lithium air battery is one of the examples that gives you, on the back of an envelope, a factor of 10 more energy density. So you can store a lot more energy in chemical bonds than you can in intercalation, and that is the second idea. So lithium air is an example, but also lithium sulfur, sodium sulfur, and lots of other examples, too. Third idea is this one. Instead of having a crystalline anode and cathode, so crystalline electrodes, get rid of them and replace them with liquids. And one of the reasons for that is when you're dealing with an intercalated system, you have to have a working ion and a host that are compatible with each other, that actually work together very well. But you can put almost anything in solution. So you eliminate one of the restrictions on the materials that you can use uh, for anodes and cathodes in the battery. So the liquid could be a true solution, or it could be a suspension. And the number of things that you can think of to put in solution is huge, much bigger. In fact, this has the most unexplored territory associated with it uh, compared to the other two ideas. So there's lots of headroom here for improvement. So these things are called non-aqueous redox flow. Why non-aqueous? We don't want to use water. You want to use an organic electrolyte. Uh, and the number of things you can put there is really, really vast. So undercutting all of these, these three ideas is one cross-cutting opportunity for materials. Use organic materials. Why? Because they're cheap. Uh, secondly, they're abundant. They're made of things like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. Those things are everywhere. Virtually harmless to the environment, so you can recycle them very easily. And important for us in the battery business, they're complex. So here's a basic organic molecular structure. You can modify that, tailor it, custom design it, by hanging ligands off it. So you can make it simply by hanging ligands off this structure. You can make it very soluble or insoluble, very active electrochemically or completely inactive. And it's this tailoring uh, feature that is so appealing to us. So this is an opportunity that cross, especially for the flow batteries, but also for the other, other batteries that really uh, cross cuts all of these concepts. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about our roadmap, because this will, you'll see in a minute, why this business is so complex. And that's both a challenge. You have to overcome that complexity, but it's an opportunity. It means there are many routes to getting to the next generation battery. So I start this with a simple diagram. 555 five, five at the top, that's our outcome. You've got to have top-down challenges, as we mentioned. And those challenges are embodied in these three basic components of a battery, anode, electrolyte, cathode. Uh, <clears throat> and you want them to perform very well. So each one of them has to perform five times better than the lithium ion batteries that we have now. So that's a challenge. Lots of concepts for the anodes. So you could have a pure metal anode. You could have an intercalant, as we have in lithium ion batteries. Or you could have a liquid. Three choices, three conceptual choices for the anode. For the electrolyte, you could have a liquid or a solid, and batteries are made with both. For the cathodes, similar to the anodes, you could have an intercalate, like we have in uh, lithium ion batteries now. A chemical transformation, for example, lithium air would be an example of that, or a purely liquid cathode called a catholite. So you see here three anode choices, two electrolyte choices, three cathode choices. Multiply them together, and you get 18. So there are 18 different conceptual ways to build the next generation battery. And already you see some of the complexity and the opportunity cropping up. But it gets better. So these are just concepts. If you want to have a material, what would the metal be? Well, it might be lithium. It might be magnesium. It might be aluminum. So I've listed here, and there are other choices. So three things that this could be. There are lots of opportunities for each one of these concepts. If you put a material on the concept, the number of possibilities goes from 18 to some much bigger number, certainly more than 50 ways to build 
the next generation battery. And you see, again, the complexity. So we challenge this. We do that. We address this by defining 10 science challenges. These are discovery science challenges that have to do with how these concepts operate and how these materials behave. So there are 10 of them that, in a sense, that represent all of that, those two lines. And we explore them in the basic science part, the discovery science part of J. Caesar. Here are the three concepts, and of course, a cross-cutting science feature as well. So the point of this part of our functional diagram is to do the basic science of these materials and these concepts. So after you once select materials, of course, you do bottom-up research here from the atomic and molecular level. You face now an integration challenge. So you have to find an anode, an electrolyte, and a cathode that work together as a system. And that brings you an engineering challenge, achieve the near theoretical energy density in a practical device. And we do that by, as we were saying earlier, building the battery on the computer. And you're starting to see our functional diagram reappear here in this strategic roadmap. Instead of going left to right, it goes bottom up. So there's the battery design. There's the prototyping. And you can now start to pick out pathways. So you might take, for example, a metal anode, a liquid electro electrolyte, and uh, uh, say a chemical transformation here, and make a lithium air battery. And in fact, that's represented in that square at the top. And we have done a, a system analysis, a techno-economic model of exactly this lithium air battery to understand what, is, what are the possibilities for it. You can change that so you can get rid of the transformation here, take an intercalant type of cathode, and then you get, for example, a magnesium battery, magnesium ion battery, that might be used for transportation. So that would be, for example, the transportation prototype. And in J. Caesar, we've already started to make that magnesium ion transportation prototype. You can do something else. So you can get rid of all of these components and take uh, the liquid uh, anode, the solid electrolyte, and the liquid cathode and make a redox flow battery. And we've started to model and also prototype, very primitive stage, the redox flow battery. So here you see, in a sense, our progress to date. And you see that there are many, many more opportunities, pathways, to get to 555 than even the ones that we've selected here to work with initially. So the problem, the challenge, and what Jay Caesar the new feature that we bring to the table is incorporating discoveries, innovations to do these things, and the expert judgment of the scientists to choose which are the most promising directions going forward, emphasize them. And as we learn more about them, say a year from now, we may decide, oh, the battery we thought was promising last year, it turns out, isn't so promising. But here's another one that looks pretty good. And we'll drop this line and bring on a new line. And this is a critical feature. We don't know the pathway to 555 at this moment. We know there are many. And we have confidence that we will discover, and through our expert judgment, uh, pursue uh, the ones that are the most promising. OK, a couple of more points. Then I'd like to have some questions. So I mentioned three concepts, energy storage concepts. And you might have thought initially, well, J. Caesar's trying to make three batteries, or three battery types. No. We want to combine those concepts so that the ultimate battery might have threads taken from all three concepts. And here's an example. We might take a multivalent metal anode, so magnesium with two charges, an electrolyte, which we discover in our electrolyte genome, and a flowable cathode, which might look something like this, being a liquid. And you see we've taken elements from all three concepts and combined them in a way to produce a potential, a candidate, for the next generation uh, beyond lithium ion battery. So it's important to know that the flexibility is there to, to mix and match. Uh, and then 
almost my last point. I want to emphasize that we, JCs, are, are a microcosm of DOE. So here's our functional paradigm. Combines research, development, demonstration, deployment. These, on the strip below, are the words that DOE, the big DOE, uses to describe itself. So they talk about grand challenges, things that I'd like to know because they're interesting. Not sure that they're useful, but they're very interesting, and someday they will be. What they call, and we call, discovery science. So I want to discover a new cathode. I want to discover something that will make my battery better. And I'll do the science that you know, leads to that discovery. Use-inspired basic science, I want a better cathode. So let me do the science, the basic science that will, the basic understanding at the atomic and molecular level that will let me make uh, the new cathode, which is better than the one that I have now. So everything you see to the left here is based on phenomena and materials and understanding. Everything that you see to the right, so applied research and te uh, technology maturation and development, is based on making a product or a technology work better. So this is based on performance. That side is based on phenomena. But this is what DOE does. And they do it in, in many offices with uh, lots of tentacles in the community, the research community and the manufacturing community. We do the same things, but we're a small, close-knit, highly interactive organization. And our thesis is that we can do it faster and better. So we can dramatically accelerate the pace of discovery and innovation and shorten the time from conception to commercialization through this uh, highly interactive or small organization. So are, is it working or not? That's a good question you could ask. Uh, here's our paradigm again, our functional diagram. We actually have already, so we started January basically we were announced in uh, the last day of November last year. The holidays came. They had to get the money to us. We really started in January. We've had about eight months of operation. Maybe it's nine months. Uh, but we've already got uh, accomplishments in every one of these fields. So here's an accomplishment that came largely from Berkeley Lab. Chevrel phases, a certain kind of intercalate host for magnesium. It's a metal, that means there's some free electrons around which screen the double charge of the magnesium. And what was found, what David Prendergast found theoretically, is that the magnesium ion plus its charge cloud, which compensates the charge, is the object which moves. It's a compound object which moves. It moves a lot faster and allows a lot more magnesium to be put into the intercalate host than if it were not screened. And that's a major insight. He is now doing the theoretical calculations to model that, and he has suggested uh, a number of experiments to validate and further explore this effect. When it comes to battery design, I mentioned we'd already, uh, uh, through techno-economic modeling, simulated a lithium air battery. This is the work of Kevin Gallagher, who's in the audience, and his colleagues, some of whom are at GM. Uh, so if you look here, this is the, uh, Gravimetric energy density, so the, the, the energy per kilogram, that's the volumetric, so energy per unit volume. This, that square, that's cross, is the target for JCs, or that's the 5.5. Five. Uh, and you see that at least one of the modeled lithium air batteries, this L, uh, lithium Li202 open system, contains that dot. So that validates the vision of J. Caesar that this is within reach. And this, of course, is for a manufactured battery, not a research prototype, that if you could build it and overcome some of the challenges which are implicit in this simulation, it would produce the five, five, the two five, first two fives of J. Caesar's goals. You also notice that uh, we wanted to have some context. So here's something that looks very much like the present lithium ion battery. And there's another battery with a lithium metal anode and a special cathode that performs in the same category as the lithium air. So it tells you there's more than one way to skin this cat. And it also tells you the importance of metal anodes for getting the energy density up. So the lithium air 
battery has a metal anode, so does that one at the top. Uh, and we're now thinking of emphasizing in JCs or a basic science, discovery science research program on how metal anodes work, whether they're lithium, magnesium, or aluminum. So a way in which our research is already teaching us, showing us the way forward. I mentioned that we made a magnesium ion transportation prototype. Here's what it looks like, really simple. It's in the lab. We only have a few cycles on it. But we're getting the baseline information so that when we make our improvements, we'll know how much did we improve it. And we talked about the commercial sector. So here's some links to the private sector. There's one piece of new intellectual, intellectual property. It's called uh, an infinite current collector, uh, which is much more efficient, again, in the laboratory uh, than the current collectors we have now. It's basically a carbon network. Uh, that's been uh, submitted for a patent already. Uh, and we've uh, involved JCI, the battery manufacturer in Milwaukee, in six of our research projects. They're interested enough to join as an unfunded collaborator these projects because they, they're very interested in the outcome. And we're now in negotiation with a startup company which has developed some uh, IP. They're, this company is several years old. Uh, they've developed some IP in one of the concepts that Jay Caesar is pursuing. They'd like to give us that IP and maybe accelerate our progress by a year or two by doing so. In return, they'd like to have uh, licensing rights or ownership of IP that flows from the IP they gave us. So we haven't concluded this, uh, this negotiation yet, but it seems likely that we will. So here's my last slide and my perspective. What have I told you? Uh, the vision is big, transform uh, transportation and the electricity grid. The mission is clear. We know what we need, 555. Five, five. You've got to get factors of five improvement in performance and lower cost. Nothing less would be transformative. We know how to do it, what we call the three legacies. You've got to look at the fundamental science, develop that base, something that the battery community today typically does not do. You have to produce these prototypes, and it's likely that the transportation and the grid prototype will be different, uh, but they could rely on the same under basic underlying concepts and knowledge. And you have to have a new paradigm. So you have to have fast and efficient communication across the pieces of Jay Caesar if you're going to do this uh, in a short time. So here's the summary of everything. It's a bold new approach to battery R&D. We want to accelerate the pace of discovery and innovation. And we want to shorten the time from the conception to commercialization. So with that, I think I'll end. Thank you very much. OK, we're now going to take questions from the audience. So please raise your hand, and someone will pass a mic to you. There is one right here. Uh, so you mentioned how J. Caesar will be focusing on five times the storage, but will J. Caesar also be focusing on durability, such as like how many times you can charge it? Yeah, great question. So in our 555, we didn't mention charging time because we simply wanted to keep it simple and understandable uh, to the wider community. But certainly, charging time is a key feature. And I'll, I'll tell you a story. You may know this. Uh, Chevy Volt goes about 38 miles on a charge. It takes about 10 hours for that charge to do that charge if you do it at uh, house voltage. Uh, if you divide those two numbers, it's about 16 minutes a mile to charge. Uh, if you're a fast walker, you can walk to your destination before you can charge your car and drive there. <laughs> so that doesn't make sense. It's clear that that's an issue, and it will be an issue for many consumers. Overnight charging is quite OK, but if you go to work and want to charge or go shopping and want to charge, it's not. So that's a technical problem. Uh, and uh, that is something that we're looking at. And if you look at our numbers, which are not on this graph, uh, we do have a, a, uh, a metric for how fast we want to be able to charge the battery. Lithium ion batteries, I mean, in inevitably, if you just crank up the voltage, it'll charge faster, but you do damage to the battery. And you know, it depends on which one do you value the most. I want to charge fast and have my battery wear out sooner, or the other way around. 
So that's something that it's a technical problem and it needs attention, and we're looking at it. Uh, also that, but I also uh, like. Will it be focusing on how many times you can charge the battery? Right. Yeah, every, so how many cycles? So, uh, I mean, the batteries you buy now are guaranteed for something like eight years. And I'm pretty sure that there's not very much experience behind that guarantee, so it's a guess. Uh, and as the eight year mark goes by, you may see a lot of people selling their cars or doing other things in response to that piece of information. But I think we need to know that a little bit better than we do know it. And again, you, you learn that from experience. Okay, thank you. Here we go. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> one question I had when you talked about the multivalent alternatives with uh, replacing lithium with aluminum or magnesium, yes. which also mentioned uh, gravimetric density. Yes. And it strikes me that aluminum and magnesium are inherently heavier. Yes. So does that really pay off? You get three times as more electrons, but but the weight is way higher heavier. too. So okay. how do you win or not? Right. So if you did everything else being equal, so you'd still used intercalation hosts and simply replaced lithium with magnesium or aluminum, it's a question you'd have to ask, and it would depend on circumstances. You would probably win. But the idea is that maybe you don't need to use those intercalation hosts. So if you combine that with another with chemical transformation, yeah. let's say. And suddenly you get rid of a lot of the so-called dead weight, the triple electron. and okay. you'll do much better. But but even just magnesium by itself, the calculations are you'll do better. Not a full factor of two because, as you mentioned, the the magnesium is is heavier. But actually, it's the packaging and other things that put most of the weight into the battery. Very true. So it doesn't glow up proportionally, and in fact, it's still a win. Good point. Thank you. As you said that um, magnesium and aluminum would be better options for, as a anode and cannot, would carbon nanotubing be an even better option? Sorry, I missed the question. Could you repeat? Would carbon nanotubing be a better option than magnesium and lithium and aluminum? Would carbon? Yes. Uh, actually, that hasn't been given a lot of thought. So carbon is often thought of as a host material or a structural, structural material or a current collecting material or a, a conductor. And there are lots of ideas for using carbon nanotubes and other forms of carbon, black carbon, in batteries. Uh, it, it, I don't think it's been suggested as the working ion. Uh, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have a lot of value uh, for the other parts of the battery. Yeah, you mentioned in your uh, slides there that uh, in the national grid we generate uh, electricity by uh, coal, gas, and wind, and solar. Yes. And then you need batteries to uh, store the energy inconsistency of solar and uh, you know and that kind of thing. What about nuclear energy? That uh, fusion and uh, fission reactors, you don't, you wouldn't have to need any storage uh, system. Yeah, that's a great point. So, I mean, there are lots of ways going forward, and you don't have to rely on renewables for you know, expanding the grid capacity. You could think of other things. Most places, China may be, well, let me not characterize any countries, but uh, there's a strong movement to go renewable. The impact on things like nuclear reactors uh, is different. So they typically have a base load. You don't want to run them up and down at all. If your renewables get to a certain level, and Germany is talking about very high levels above 50%, 60 or 70 or even 80%, then it may be that the only way that operates is when they're running full blast, both wind and solar, is to turn, uh, curtail the nuclear or the conventional gas. And that's a challenge. I think where we are right now, and probably for the next five to 10 years, it's not going to be a problem we face uh, in reality. We certainly face it on paper, and we need to find a way to solve it. But there are many solutions to that problem, and there are many opinions about what the best solution is. I think uh, you know, the market, the regulatory environment, and the technology, and of course, public acceptance, what people will take and not take, it's a combination of those things that will determine what, what do we finally do about that. But you raise a question that I think is being debated. 
This, this question comes from Twitter. This is from somebody actually who's in Indiana right now. Um, his question is, what are your thoughts on alloy anodes? Sorry, I, sorry, I missed that. Um, what are your thoughts on alloy anodes? Alloy anodes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good technology. In fact, Jay Caesar and the battery program at Argonne, which preceded Jay Caesar, has looked into alloy anodes extensively. And one nice thing about them is that there's lots of uh, variety there. Like you can, al you can alloy with many different components, metals. You can alloy to certain, to many concentrations, and you can alloy with even more than one component. So uh, it's a wide open area. Is it promising? Yes, it's promising. Is it better than everything else you could do? That we don't know yet, because we haven't explored all the other options. And you can see, I think, from our roadmap that if we're going to do this strategically and logically, we should think about every option, option and compare one against the other. So alloys are quite live, and uh, we'll have to see over the next five years how they go. Uh, yes, I know, yeah, I know you focused on transportation and power grid applications, but uh, my question has to do with what, the po what are the possibilities for like spin-off applications that could even get into uh, normal consumer markets for batteries, uh, or residential batteries to augment, you know, power from the power grid or even solar or, or things like that. Are, are these possibilities, or are these simply ruled out already by no. the, the structure of the program? That's a great question. They're very live possibilities. So let me give you an example. Uh, you, first, the background. We've been talking about wind and solar. You build a wind farm, and you put a battery at the wind farm to back it up when the winds doesn't blow. That's one application. There's another way to solve that problem. You put the battery at the edge of the grid, as they say, so distribute it. Bring it out to a homeowner or a neighborhood or a commercial building. and when you do that, the battery can perform more than one function. So for example, let's say I'm a homeowner. Let's take the smallest example. I'm a home homeowner. I put a solar panel on the roof and a battery in the basement. I can make them both DC, because the solar panel is DC to start with. The battery is DC. It charges and discharges DC. And most of the things I do in my house are, in fact, DC. So light bulbs happen to be AC. They could just as well be DC. LED light bulbs have to be DC. My computer, the first thing I do when the AC comes in is transform it to DC and then use it at 5 volts or some other voltage. So if you restrict the system to your house, you can do away with a lot of the uh, switching from AC to DC, save money, and simplify the systems. That's one thing. Second thing is that uh, you get more than just smoothing the solar power from the roof. So that battery system can also act as a backup in case, for example, a tree limb hits the power line and you can't get external power. Well, I've got my battery in the basement. Uh, it also can act to uh, improve the power quality. So digital power quality is a higher level than our typical uh, non-digital uses, so for computers can be, uh, they'll drop out if the, if the frequency changes or if there's a momentary drop in voltage. Uh, you can prevent, prevent that with your battery system. So you're getting, at least with that example, three functions in one. And the feeling in the storage analysts, the feeling is that the big payoff from storage will, become, will come from these multifunctional uh, applications where you get more than one payback. So that's an advantage of doing it in your house. You could imagine now a commercial building is a bigger uh, base for a battery system and would operate differently, but still very much smaller than anything you would have for a wind farm. And a neighborhood grid, microgrid for the neighborhood, would be in the same category. Which one of those is going to turn out to be the best? Don't know. But that analysis really hasn't been done. And let me add, since I'm on this subject, add one more thing. Jay Caesar's goal is to reduce the cost of storage by a factor of five. Almost all the analyses now take the present technological cost of storage into account in doing their analysis. If it were a factor of five less, then suddenly things that are not economical now would be economical. And you would have a completely different picture of where storage would be employed in the grid. Uh, we're trying to get people to do these studies now that we have, we've announced our goals and they're 
out there in the community. And I hope that within a couple of years, we will have a couple of studies that say the impact of five times less storage cost is this. And I'm expecting it would be significant. Uh, if you were successful meeting your goals on, on a lithium battery, for example, how, how much lithium is there in the world, uh, or what percent of this power could you store with the amount of lithium that is available in the world? Great question, and one I didn't, didn't really address at all. So for every new energy technology that you think of, you should first ask the question, is it scalable up to take care of a sizable fraction of our energy needs. So for lithium ion batteries, we have that battery, and now they're being used in cars. You could ask, well, suppose every car on the road were, were driven by lithium ion. Would, is there enough lithi lithium in the world to do that? And you'll get, I, I think the answer is probably yes. Of course, not every car would switch and so on. So probably the answer is yes, but you'd have to recycle. So if you wanted to mine fresh lithium for every car battery and then throw it away at the end, you'd soon run out of lithium, and that's pretty clear. So you have to recycle. That's the first thing. The second thing is that when you talk about beyond lithium ion, it doesn't have to, there are some lithium technologies that are beyond lithium ion, like lithium air, but there's lots that use magnesium, and there's plenty of magnesium, or let's say much more magnesium in the world than there is lithium, and aluminum even more. Uh, but you ought to be asking this question. And that's one of the appeals of these organic materials that I was talking about, because they're just dirt cheap. You know, in, in a sense, they are dirt. And you can, <laughs> you can recycle them easily. Uh, there's plenty in the world. And you really don't face that problem. But that is a key question to ask. Okay, with uh, so many collaborators, then uh, who would eventually own the IP coming out of uh, such a collaboration, collaborative effort at the JCs? Sorry, I missed the question. With so many collaborators, who would eventually own the intellectual property coming out ah, of? Okay, great question. Also, didn't address that one either. So we expect to produce a lot of intellectual property. Uh, in fact, you know, that's in a sense our goal. Uh, and how do we deal with that? So before our proposal was submitted, so this was a year ago last May, we had already worked closely with our partners to create uh, an intellectual property plan which was signed and executed before the proposal went in. It has some interesting features. So one feature is that, by agreement, Argonne will be the sole negotiating agent. So an outside company wants to license our technology, they don't have to go to 14 places to get an agreement. They come to one place, and Argonne represents all of our partners and, of course, would consult with them. But that dramatically streamlines the process. Another feature is that we have explicitly written in our plan that no partner should expect to have an exclusive license. So it doesn't mean that they won't get one. It doesn't mean that we might not negotiate an exclusive license with someone just because it makes sense from the Jay Caesar point of view or from the point of view of getting the technology out there. But no partner has the, has the right to expect that. So uh, these two things are key features of our policy. Now, who owns it? Well, if Argonne does it by itself, Argonne owns it. If Argonne and three others of the 14 partners uh, collaborate to do it, we all own it, we'd have to then negotiate you know, how much of it does each one of us own. But this is pretty standard in the field, so this is one of the models that is out there. And we're not really anticipating a problem there. So our, our IP plan, it, it doesn't in advance handle every situation that will come up. It's more of a framework, but it sets a framework that would allow solutions, reasonable solutions for, we hope, every situation that would come up. My question relates to those very situations you were discussing. Uh, 555 can be met, but it seems to me there will be many additional questions which someone in the organization will have to respond to. Uh, you've already mentioned cycle life of a battery. What about things like reliability, safety, yeah. uh, discharge capability of the batteries? Who in the organization is going to be facing these questions 
and at what point of the development cycle? So that's a great question. Uh, and again, our 555 is pretty simple because we, we want it to be simple. But the question of charging is important. The question of safety is really important. And that's one where technology and even our materials genome uh, activities can contribute. So for example, in the present lithium ion batteries, there are two cathodes you can use. Uh, and one of them has a runaway reaction with the electrolyte that happens at some elevated temperature, but has a, a high energy density. The other one, it's a higher temperature where that uh, runaway reaction occurs, so it's safer, but it has a lower energy, energy density. So the customer, in a sense, has to make a choice which one is more important, the energy density or the safety, and you can trade these off against each other. But in our designs, and especially in our materials genome uh, activity, we can survey all the possible side reactions that would happen with a given cathode and a given electrolyte and look for the ones where they happen at very high temperatures, so they're less likely to occur, that would give us a safer battery. So it's possible to design that safety feature in. At the moment, I mean, we're doing that survey right now, so we don't know what the outcome will be, but it's something over which we would have some control. And the other things you mentioned, I think, are in a similar category. All right, let's take two more questions. There's one here and there's one in the back. So we'll start you in the th th third row. I think you touched on my, my question, but I, I know that lithium batteries uh, are impacted by temperature, low temperature, they lose uh, capacity. Uh, will your computer programs use temperature and try to, you know, it's a chemical reaction, uh, so, you know, temperature might be used as a catalyst or the titration by uh, even agitation or something to improve, you know, it could be mechanical ag agitation to make a better battery, you know. So if I got the question, correct me if I'm wrong, it was about temperature, about low temperatures and the operation of, say, lithium ion or the next generation yeah, of batteries. How do, how do we lick that and how do we up? Yeah. So yes, uh, again, it's, this, it's the kinetics of a reaction. So when it gets cold outside, I mean, the rule of thumb, every chemist knows this, every 10 degrees centigrade that you go lower, reactions go half as fast. So uh, when you get down to zero, the battery doesn't have a lot of chemical reactivity left in it. It's hard to, hard to start. So you can just keep the battery warm. That's one thing. If it's a grid battery, you can do that by putting it in a house that you heat. If it's your car battery, you can put it in your garage that you heat, or you could plug a little, screw a little heater uh, pad into the battery and plug it in just to keep it warm overnight. The solution is to find a battery that operates better at lower temperatures. And that is, in fact, one of the things that you can design in. So you can ask for a given you know, set of, uh, say, anodes and cathodes and electrolytes, what are the reactions that take place and how does the rate depend on temperature? And again, it's a choice of the material. Now, you'll inevitably have to make compromises because you can't satisfy all the requirements that you want, but you can have some control over that. So, I mean, great question. And I think a part of the answer is actually in the beyond lithium ion space, there are so many battery designs and configurations using different materials and concepts that have not been explored that the probability is good, there's a good chance, that you can satisfy uh, the conditions that you're really most concerned about, unlike lithium ion, which you're pretty much stuck with what you have. There's a little variation, but uh, not as much as in the beyond lithium ion space. OK, sorry. Um, you, you mentioned near the beginning that the uh, fundamental limits of battery performance are about 10 times beyond where they are now. And I was wondering if you could comment on what places the fundamental limit on how good a battery can be. I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble here. Could you repeat that again? Yeah, sure. I was just wondering, can you tell us what is it that places a fundamental limit on how much energy you can store in a battery? Oh. Which you said is about 10 times away right. from where we are. Yeah. Oh, OK, great question. So um, the energy density is determined by the voltage window between the anode and the cathode. And that's pretty much determined by the electrolyte that you can find. So electrolytes have voltage windows that are either small. In the case of water, as an elect electrolyte, it's 1.2 volts. That's very small. The uh, electrolytes that are used in lithium ion can be as high as 3 or 4 volts. So uh, the higher the voltage, the higher uh, the energy you can store. 
the other thing, it's voltage and one other quantity, the amount of charge that you can put into the cathode or the anode, or the amount of charge which oscillates back and forth between anode and cathode. And that depends on the holding power of the anode and cathode. So right now, the, one of the best anodes we know about, which is not really used in, in batteries yet, is silicon, which has a capacity for holding charge that's about a factor of 10 better than what we now use for lithium ion. Now, that doesn't mean uh, that you'll get that factor of 10, because you have to pair silicon with an electrolyte and with a cathode, and it's they don't also have a factor of 10 more capacity than the present lithium ion batteries, you won't get the full factor of 10, you'll get something less. But the fundamental, I think the answer to your question is, it depends on the, uh, on the material that you choose, and that depends on the, the database of materials from which you choose it. So if you can find a material, say an electrolyte with a high uh, voltage window, and an anode and a cathode with a lot of charge capacity, then that determines the limit for those materials. And it's just a question of what materials do you have out there. There's no fundamental law that says it's always less than a certain amount, no matter the material. It's very material dependent. And that's one of the reasons why it's important to do these genomic uh, surveys, so that you're looking at 1,000 or 10,000 materials. So you think you've probably got a base that's big enough to capture most of the possibilities. Thank you, everyone. Uh, please join me in thanking George uh, for a really thoughtful and Thank thorough you. discussion.